Hello? 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 Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Animal Quest episode 20. Can you believe that? What the heck? I'm late. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. We just switched over. You are good to go. I just started. Literally. You're here on time. Right on time. Good job, chatter. Nice. Nice. The series went by too fast. Did it? I don't know. I think I've been doing it for literally two years. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that it's gone by. I think this is the longest running show in Twitch history. Maybe. And we still have one more to go. Hello, I'm doing the dishes. Hello. I have seen a couple, and by a couple, I think I literally mean on two, like two people in chat say that this is their first Animal Quest, or the first one that they're catching live. Hello, welcome. Um, excited you guys are here. I do have two mics because we will be going outside today. Hooray. Wait, we're out of animals? Yes, the only, the last Animal Quest episode we're going to have after this is Scorpions. Um, so we have marmosets this month, scorpions next month, and then we start a new show. But today we have Animal Quest. If you have not been here for an Animal Quest before, we do a spotlight stream on one of the species that we have here at Alveus. I write a whole presentation and I talk to you about the species and about what you can do to help them. Um, and we go out and meet that animal as well. So we will be going out to see the marmosets too. Count them two times today, or at the beginning, so you guys can meet them. And then at the end for the, for the Q&A segment. Um, if you have a question throughout the stream that comes up, you can ask them in chat if I see it and can respond to it. I will. Uh, but if I don't respond to it or you want to save it for the end, you can do hashtag ask followed by your question. Thank you, Shrez. Uh, and ask a question. And then we will do the Q&A at the end with the marmosets. Some of you watched this episode be written last night because Alveus has a subathon going on. By some of you, I mean almost all of you, probably, realistically speaking, because uh, we just started. <laughs> so you guys already know what's going to happen today, okay? But there is stuff that you have not seen. So, hello, Alveus enjoyers. Welcome to Animal Quest episode 20. Let's begin. Are you guys ready? Any questions, comments, or concerns before we begin? Thank you, Slice. Questions, comments, concerns? Good start. Good start. I just need to click on Prezi to, oh, here it is. All right. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I can do it down here. It's just cringe. Okay. This video was made yesterday by Shrez. Who are our marmosets? Shrez typed that in Google. That's crazy. He's an animator. <laughs> There's Oppa getting his meds. We have two oh my God, monkeys. monkeys. They're marmosets. One common marmoset and one black tufted marmoset. They came from a neglect case in Austin. Somebody bought them as pets um, and didn't really take care of them like they need to be taken care of. So they had a pretty poor diet, not a lot, not a lot of sunlight. They both have metabolic bone disease, have had a lot of dental issues. Momo got 15 additional teeth removed um, because he, his teeth were just like rotting out of his mouth. They're a very important story for the pet trade um, to show people why they shouldn't have 
exotic pets and why they shouldn't have monkeys as pets because they end up in situations like this. So we've been very, very careful how we present them. Nice. Um, big shout out to Shrez for making that literally yesterday uh, because I forgot to commission that video a month ago like I normally do. So I messaged Shrez yesterday and I was like, any chance? And he's like, yep. And he made that yesterday. So thank you, Shrez, for that video. Very nice. Uh, we always start these animal quests by talking about the animal that we have here right? The animals that we have here are ambassadors to teach people about certain things. So it's important that you have a connection to the animal here. That's why we do those videos so you know who they are. You really want to know who they are? Let's go meet them. We're going to go meet the marmosets. Um, we're going to swap over to the backpack and go out to their enclosure so you guys can see them. Not quite IRL, but m kind of IRL. You guys can see them in person. Nope, not in person. You guys can see them in the flat. Nope. Thank you for the prime. So you guys can see them. <laughs> in real time, baby. Live. <laughs> On the screen. In your browser. Do you have your permission slips to go outside? Yes. Interesting. Interesting. I see a lot of no's. It's kind of crazy. Um, can I get a chair? Is it over here? Does Connor have it? Oh, nice. Thank you. Okay. 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 Chat phone. Chat phone. Chat phone. We're swapped over. Hello? Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Alright, guys. Let's go see the marmoset, shall we? Okay. We can. We don't need to bring all this out there with us. For the record, sometimes we bring animals in here for Animal Quest. The monkeys have never been in here, uh, and they, I won't say never will be, but it wouldn't be ideal for sure. All right. I really hope it's unlocked. Should I bring a key just in? Yeah, I'll bring a key just in case. What are you doing? He's trying to catch a prank mantis. Okay. So, you guys, um, we're gonna go see the marmosets. Okay, like you saw in that video. Uh, both of these came from a neglect case in the city of Austin. Someone bought them online as pets, had them for a few years, uh, and just didn't know how to take care of them properly. So they're fed an improper diet. They were in a pretty small enclosure as well. Uh, and so they had some muscular atrophy. Appa to the point where he had not a lot of use of his back legs because it was so severe. Momo uh, has pretty bad dental disease, has had to get more than half of his teeth removed. Um, and it's kind of like the equivalent of if you fed your kid a really, really poor diet and their teeth were rotting out. So... They also had vitamin D deficiencies because they never got access to the outside or to enough sunlight. So small cage, not a lot of sunlight. Uh, they had never lived outside and um, they were surrendered to our veterinarian who declared neglect uh, and our veterinarian contacted us. And that's how they came here. Um, this is their first 
outdoor enclosure. This is the first time that they live that they've lived outside. Otherwise, they had only lived inside of a pretty small cage in someone's house. Um, but now they have this whole space. They do have an indoor and outdoor space because these are Brazilian monkeys. We'll talk more about their wild counterparts when we go inside. But um, they're in Texas. We're in Texas, so they have a climate-controlled room. So they have AC. They'll have heat in the winter as well. Makes sense. Makes sense. So they had, they went through kind of a rehab process with us for about six months. And we got them here at the end of last year. And they were inside getting antibiotics um, and some other medications um, and doing a bit of physical therapy. Uh, and now Momo has really, really, or Appa has really great use of his back legs. You'll see that when we go in there. Chat, don't be so nervous. You can, you can come inside. <laughs> okay. So. Here's the marmoset enclosure. There's one behind you. <laughs> Look. This is Momo. Hello, buddy. Momo is a black tufted marmoset. So he is the one that has had more than half of his teeth removed because he had dental disease when he came to us. Now his uh, oral health is in much better shape, but he does have, he is missing half of his teeth. So he's got kind of an old man mouth. Hi, want to see chat? Say hi. What do you think? He doesn't care. All right. Then we have Oppa. Hi, bud. What are you doing? This is the one who had very little use of his back legs when we got him. Clearly, that is no longer the case. Also, his name when we got him was Kevin. Momo's name was Momo, and it was Momo and Kevin. We changed it to Momo and Appa because it's, it's, because it's better. <laughs> Hi, do you want to see chat? Today is about you, do you understand? What do you think? Appa is a common marmoset. He had some pretty severe muscular atrophy when we got him. So again, these back legs from the middle of his spine down, just like very little use. And he's squeaking. Marmosets make a pretty wide range of vocalizations. One of them is this little kind of curious squeak. They also, I can't imitate it, but they do a very high pitched kind of scream. <laughs> The difference between these two guys, these are both marmosets, so they're both primates, they're both monkeys. They're just very small, um, but they're different species. So I have range maps inside to show you guys where they live. They do overlap a little bit, um, but they're different species. So he's a black tufted marmoset because he has black tufts on his ears. And then Appa is a common marmoset. Believe it or not, sometimes they're called a white tufted marmoset because Thank you for, that was actually really nice of you guys to show them that. Because <laughs> he has white tufts on his ears, okay? But genetically, obviously they're very similar, but they are distinct, two different species. Uh, but still, marmosets all live in groups, uh, no matter what the species is. Primates, you guys probably know, are very social. Um, and so they live in family units uh, of up to 15 individuals usually. And so they have to be together. He had, the guy that bought them online, I think had, I think he had Momo first. I don't remember which one of them he had first. I think it was Momo. I think he had Momo first for like a whole year um, alone, which is really, really awful for their welfare. And so luckily he got another one and, and they're, they're friends for that reason. And they came to us together. Um, but yeah, we were really worried when we put them, what is wrong? We were really worried when we put them in this enclosure. Do you guys want to come over here and show them? Appa, come here. Come over here. 
we were really worried when we moved them into this enclosure because um, they had never lived outside before. And so we thought it would be really overwhelming because there's obviously a lot of smells and sounds and things. Hello. <laughs> Hi. But they adjusted really, really beautifully to being in this enclosure. They have essentially this space. Uh, I doubt you can see through this from there, but they have essentially this space inside. There's AC in here and there are dog doors, so it keeps the AC in. Yes, they loved it straight away. They loved it straight away. They love it out here. Um, you guys probably just saw someone asked if they were legally purchased. Yes, in Texas, you can have these as pets without a permit. Um, you know what else is legal that you shouldn't do? cheat on your wife. Just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's okay. I don't think I've ever said that before. That's a bizarre thing to say, but you know what I mean? Some people are like, oh, we're allowed to have them. Doesn't mean it's okay. All right. That's not legal. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's legal. <laughs> That analogy is crazy. No, it's not. It makes sense. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can, you can buy monkeys online and have them as pets. A lot of Animal Quest today is going to be talking about why that's not okay um, for the welfare of these monkeys, because they're not meant to be pets and they're not meant to be inside your house. They are wild animals uh, and they need a lot of outside space. They need a lot of outside stimulation. Um, and you saw Momo run across, across this door frame here. Sorry, Oppa's on the cameraman, and Oppa a bites sometimes. <laughs> Did he bite you? No? Good. Um, they also bite. Monkeys bite. Surprise, surprise. Uh, they're, they're not like dogs because they're not domestic. They're wild animals. You saw Momo run across that door frame over there, and you've seen them uh, move around this enclosure. One of their ecological niches in the wild is to be seed dispersers. You guys have probably heard me talk about it. What that means is that, hi. Um, is that they eat fruits in the wild and then they run around and they poop everywhere and they disperse seeds, which helps with forest regrowth. It's very important that they do that in the wild because forest regrowth is important, uh, but they will do it in your house. So seed dispersal is not good for in your house. They also bite. Momo's missing half of his teeth, but Appa does bite. <laughs> He's bit lots of people. It's a thing that happens. Um, they're just overall really hard to have as pets. They also mark everything. I don't know if you guys have seen when we put new things in this enclosure, their first move, both of them, is Peach. Peach on it. So they'll pee on everything you have. Does it hurt when they bite? Yeah. I mean, he's got a small mouth, but so do I, and it would hurt if I bit you. Here it comes. He is like fully recovered. His use of his back legs is actually so cool to see. Hi, Momo. What are you, are you sitting? What are you looking for? You wanna see chat? Also, he's looking at you. Also, uh, oh god, <laughs> these, sorry, um, he almost timed someone out. <laughs> these monkeys, like all of the animals that we have at, Alba at Alveus, are rescued animals and they're non-releasable. Um, so with these guys in particular, number one, they're Brazilian monkeys, so we obviously can't open the doors here and they can't survive in Texas. Uh, number two, they were both born in captivity, we believe. I guess there's, there's a chance that they were taken out of the wild for the pet trade. It's probably pretty slim. I think they were bred in captivity. Um, and raised by people. And so they don't know how to take care of themselves um, in the wild and they would die. So for all of the animals that we have at all this that are non-releasable, their options are either euthanasia uh, or remain in human care in captivity uh, and be a part of educational programs like this. And so that's the decision that we made for these monkeys. Of course, if they did not do well in human care, if their quality of life was really poor and they were really unhappy, then they would, uh, sorry, Appa is holding the camera like a cameraman. He's gonna bite you, I'm sorry. Um, if these animals were not happy in captivity and 
they showed lots of signs of stress and just had really poor quality of life, then we would choose euthanasia for them because that would be the most humane thing to do. But because these monkeys were raised with people, they do all right. Um, we do a lot of training with them by we, I mean our animal care staff. Um, and they've done really, really well adjusting here. And so uh, for them, it's life and human care, teaching people about marmosets so the same thing doesn't happen to other marmosets. Make sense? But, of course, if any of you are concerned about these monkeys being in captivity, just know that we are all on the same side. I would love, more than anything, for these animals to be in the wild, just like all of the animals that we have at Alveus. Uh, but for the individuals that we have on this location, or on this property, that is not an option for them. It's either euthanasia, or they're here, and we do our best. But I would love if they were in the wild. You'll see some pictures of marmosets in the wild today, and it is like... The thing about captivity is, like, we can give them ropes and, like, sticks and platforms and stuff, but these guys live, like, mid to high canopies in the rainforest, in the Amazon rainforest. Um, we can never replicate what they would have in the wild and their ability to travel and go wherever they want. Uh, and we give them enrichment and foraging feeders and stuff so they can engage in natural behaviors, but it will always be a replication of the real thing. So, obviously... The wild is, is, is the best for them. How do you catch them? I can't imagine trying to, like, you don't just, you know, I would never pick either of them up like that. One, they would hate it, and two, I would get my fingers ripped off. Um, we do a lot of voluntary husbandry training with the marmosets. Our animal care staff does a lot of voluntary husbandry training. So these guys are getting crate trained. So we have a crate, and they will voluntarily go in the crate. We'll close the door, uh, so that way we don't have to force them into any behaviors like that because it would be very stressful to like grab them and throw them in a crate so we want to make the crate a positive experience just like you would with your dog husbandry is has nothing to do with what i talked about earlier uh it's 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 uh animal care hello how long are their tails A foot? 14 inches? 13, sorry. <laughs> maybe a foot, maybe 13, 14 inches? That's a guess? Also, their tails are not prehensile. Um, there are spider monkeys, right, for instance, could hang by this rope with just their tail. They can use it to grab things. These tails are just for balance. Yeah, your tail. No touchy tail. How do they interact with other monkeys like chimpanzees? Uh, I think a chimpanzee would eat them. Probably. What do they eat? These two, under human care, get a pretty wide range of foods. One, they will hunt bugs in this enclosure. They will eat harvestmen. I don't know if you guys have noticed. When we put them in this enclosure, there were colonies of harvestmen. Like, hundreds in here. Um, I don't think they've eaten hundreds but they have definitely terrorized them enough to where they don't live in here anymore. So they will hunt bugs. They get three different types of diets, uh, formulated diets like your dog gets dog food. So they have a canned diet. They have a gel diet. Look at his little foot sticking out. <laughs> they have a canned diet. They have a gel diet. Um, and they have a, a biscuit diet, like a monkey biscuit. And so they get those three things as like their main their main staples. Uh, and then they also get mealworms from us. Uh, they get they get produce, fruits and vegetables. I'll talk more about what they eat in the wild inside. Um, it's it's similar. It's a replication of what they would eat in the wild. Actually, in the wild, they eat a lot more gum from trees, like gum trees. They'll eat like gum and saps and stuff like that. And then the occasional insect. Hi, bud. Uh, the occasional insect, if they can catch it. Him stick leggy out. Appa! Appa! What are you doing? Beep, beep. Do they have a scent? Yes. They smell like pee. Is 
it's not so bad when we're in this enclosure because it's wire and so it's super open air. But like inside or like in a spit, yeah, they just smell like pee. Do they let anyone handle them? Um, they will do. Oppa will jump on you if he's interested in something that you're doing or he wants to bite you or if you have food. So he'll like jump on your shoulders. I could not pick him up because uh, he would rip me up. Momo uh, will do some voluntary handling. So we'll put our hand out and he can walk onto your hand. Um, but all of that is not affectionate like your dog crawls into your lap and wants to be pet. Uh, it's mostly for husbandry reasons. So if we want to be able to move them around um, for their safety or like the other day Connor was in here working on their live camera and so he asked Appa to get on his hand and then moved him inside, right, as opposed to like netting him and putting him inside. Um, so we try to train behaviors that help help us avoid stressing them out and forcing them to do things for their care, if that makes sense. Kayla's much better at explaining that than I am. Hi. Coming down. Are they affectionate with each other? Yeah, um, they they groom each other. They sleep in the same hide together. If you watch the live cams at night, the marmoset is probably my favorite live cam because they get in a hide together and they literally get in a blanket and like cuddle. It's really cute. What do you think? You want to talk to them? That it? Okay. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, someone asked if their teeth will grow back. No, they won't. Those are his adult teeth. Just like us. You can come over here. What are you doing? He's sitting. He likes his branches. Me and peach jars put those up. <laughs> are they smart? Yes. Yeah, primates are very smart. Um... They're very smart. Uh, they're really good at problem solving. They're very complex social structures. Um, very hard to read. Has lots of thoughts and lots of feelings about lots of things. That's nice. Which one is friendlier to strangers like streamers? Uh, it's complicated. Appa is more curious and more willing to like come over and check you out, but he will also bite. Momo is much more reserved, and so he'll kind of hang out on the sidelines, but he won't bite. And when I say he won't bite, he's a wild animal. Of course he would bite if we like grabbed him. Um, but uh, he hasn't bit people. Appa has. They don't attack people. They haven't done that here, really. I mean, it depends on what your definition of attack is, but. Do they ever fall when they're jumping around? Yeah, way less than we would if we tried to do this though. They're definitely built for it, like built for swinging around. They have not thrown poop at anyone as far as I, as far as I know. Um, someone said, is it hard not to consider them pets, um, when, even though the whole point is to limit the illegal pet trade, it's actually really easy, uh, for me anyway, because they live in this outdoor enclosure and we're constantly talking about them this way, they do not feel like my pets whatsoever. I would never, like, I would rather die than, like, put them in my car and take them to PetSmart and, like, put an outfit on them. They're just, they're wild animals to me. Uh, and I have a, a different respect for the, not that I don't respect my dogs, but, like, I would put my dog in a sweater if she was okay with it. I would never <laughs> treat them like pets. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's just very different. It's very different. What is their main food? Um, they have a few different types of food here. They get a canned diet, a biscuit diet, and a gel diet um, that all has all the... Hello, are you relaxing? In the wild, they'll spend a lot of their time chilling like this. They're known for being 
chillers. So they're either foraging for sap and trying to catch insects, uh, or they're sitting like that in the trees and napping. What food or treat do they like most? Banana. I, kind of contributing to the stereotype, they love banana. They love banana, they love apple, they love their gel diet as well. It smells really fruity. I haven't eaten it, but like I think it's, it's like a fruity gel. This is a banana tree, actually. This is a banana. He lives here. We wanted to give them something native. Hi. MC Chat. Are their claws sharp? They are sharp. Um, their claws are really good for climbing up trees because they kind of stick in bark because they're really sharp, but they're not like shredding sharp, you know? They have more flexibility than like a, a screw would, if that makes sense. I don't know how to describe that. What is the habitat of these species? These guys uh, live in Brazil in the rainforest. Slightly different ranges, but because they're different species, but. How far do they leap? I don't know exactly how far, but they can jump pretty far. Are they territorial? Would they be okay if you added more? Um, my honest answer is I don't know. When we had, uh, when we got this enclosure inspected for our permits to have them here, um, they were like, oh, you can get six more marmosets if you want because of the minimum dimensions that we need and this enclosure is massive. Uh, but we probably won't get any more marmosets because these two are plenty to do the education that we do here and their dynamic is great and I would hate to introduce another marmoset and mess that up, you know? But they live in large numbers in the wild. Uh, groups like up to 15 in the wild. Yeah, one brings drama. They are rescues. These guys were rescued from a neglect situation in Austin. Someone bought them as a pet, as pets online uh, and just didn't take proper care of them. And that's why they're here. They had a list of medical issues and they came to us. Now they look great, you wouldn't even know. But uh, they, didn't, they didn't look or act like this when we first got them. I would, wow. <laughs> Did you guys see that? <laughs> this is a big jump. You hear that? That's another one of their vocalizations. It's a fun one. So that's the one I was like, I can't mimic it. <laughs> A little, it's a whistle note. Where's it going? We do target training with them, crate training. Um, wow. Is it nice over there? Yes. <laughs> All right, cool, you guys. So these are our marmosets, Appa and Momo. Let's go learn about them, okay? Because you guys asked a lot of questions that I will teach you about back in the studio. I, though, am sweating. He locked that. Thank you. All right, good stuff. You guys got to meet the monkeys, meet the monkeys. We love the monkeys. They're very, very fun. Um, I had wanted to do marmosets for a long time here, a long time. We've been in operation since 21. Um, <laughs> but it was something I was like, I would love eventually to do marmosets. Uh, and we hadn't really planned on getting them so soon. They just kind of fell into our lap uh, because that's how it went. 
And so we refurbished that whole enclosure, or retrofitted that whole enclosure. It was the crow enclosure. And then we built it and put all the ropes in it and everything so that the marmosets could move in there. Uh, and it ended up being perfect for the marmosets, but uh, we made that adjustment. We found out about them, and then a week later, they were here. <laughs> so it was a pretty quick turnaround. Their favorite toy or activity. Uh, we give the marmosets enrichment every day. Um, enrichment is toys and stuff, interactive things so that they can engage in natural behaviors. So for marmosets, a lot of that is foraging for their food. So we'll give them puzzle feeders, like literally the ones that they sell for dogs. Uh, silicone mats where they have to like pick out gel diet from crevices. Uh, they'll get paper cups, paper straws, tissue paper, wrapped boxes, lots of different, lots of different stuff like that. All right, back in the studio. Whew. Jeez. Okay. All right, everybody. I need water. Um, we're going to switch it. Just give us a second. And there's no water. That's okay. My water's empty. Hooray. <laughs> okay. I'm not grabbing a beer. A beer. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Swapped. Hello. Um, could you actually just like, would you mind running to the nut house and filling this up? Thank you so much. Sorry, I should have done that. <laughs> All right, folks. Hello, welcome back. Hello, welcome back to, oh, hello, welcome back to the studio. You had a lot of questions. You had a lot of questions. Let's, let's talk about them, huh? Let's talk about some of them. Those were our marmosets. So. Natural history. Mm. Natural history. Um, we have two marmoset species. Okay. We got our common marmoset, duh, and our black tufted marmoset. We just met them. That is Oppa and Momo. Look at them. So cute. They're so cute. Um, I know the graphic is blocked. Okay. Uh, they are diurnal. I don't know why my freaking cam so big. They're diurnal. Uh, and that's so close. Come on. They live in groups in the wild. Like I said, they ate in seed dispersal. They are both classified as least, least concerned by IUCN. Uh, so their population numbers in the wild, they're like, okay, but their species are, their numbers are declining as with all numbers of every species on this planet. Um, and that was hyperbolic. And they have a wide range of vocalizations. You guys heard some of their vocalizations today. Diurnal means the opposite of nocturnal. Nocturnal, awake at night. Diurnal, awake during the day. Okay? I cry. I cry. Range. They're range maps. I said I would show you range maps. I show you range maps. Common marmoset. There they are. That little red spot is where Appa would live in the wild, okay? That red spot is where Momo would live in the wild. Cool? So they're close to each other. They overlap a little bit. Just a little bit. Their wild diet. They eat lots of things in the wild. Thank you so much. So we kind of try to mimic it in captivity, uh, but they have... They eat mealworms, insects in the wild, uh, flying insects that they can catch. Uh, bird eggs, fruits, trees. Then why are they captive? I answered that like five minutes ago. Go back and check the VOD. Um, or I don't know if there's a marmoset command. These guys are non-releasable. They were raised in captivity. 
Um, so we give them something similar in captivity, but it's formulated diet. It comes out of a can or it's a biscuit or it comes in a gel uh, that we mix up for them. So yeah, but they eat a lot of different stuff in the wild. I will say, I mentioned when we were out there with them that they mostly, there are some marmoset species in the wild that their diet is composed more than 70% of sap and gum from trees. Um, so they really do rely on that. And we give them gel diet in captivity uh, and we have gum. I forget what kind of gum it is, but it comes in a powder and we mix it. And so it literally it is, when you mix it with hot water, it is like the gum that they would eat in those trees in the wild. So they do get that as well. All right. Deforestation. Okay. Um, one of the big thing, biggest, big things that I want to talk about with the marmosets today is deforestation. Um, because the reason that their populations are declining in the wild is one, because of the pet trade, because they are taken out of the wild and traded as pets online. And because a lot of deforestation is happening right now. Um, causes of deforestation. Cattle ranching is 80% of Brazil's deforestation in the past 20 years. 80%. Okay. Um, why? Because they clear cut forests so that they can have giant cattle pastures. Okay. So a lot of cattle ranching is done in those rainforests. They cut down a lot of those trees for that. Okay. Agriculture in general, um, not just cows, not just cattle, uh, but growing fruits, vegetables, crops, stuff like that. Logging for paper products, for wood products, mining, palm oil production. We're going to get deep into that today. Uh, and infrastructure expansion, people moving in to the rainforest, roads being built, stuff like that. Okay. We're going to watch a video, by the way, fun fact, this, that's what Oppa looked like as a baby. That's a common marm a baby common marmoset. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Look at him. It's just a little guy. He's so cute. Uh, we're gonna watch a little video on deforestation. Then I'm gonna we're gonna do some polls. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna or we're gonna watch the video. Then we're gonna do some polls. And I'll tell you how it works. Forests cover about thirty percent of the planet. That's a lot. And the ecosystems they create play an essential role in supporting life on Earth. But deforestation is clearing Earth's forests on a massive scale. And at the current rate of destruction, the world's rainforests could That's where they live. disappear within a hundred years. Why should we care about deforestation? Together, forestry and agriculture are responsible for 24% of greenhouse gas emissions making deforestation a significant contributor to climate change. Deforestation impacts the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere the in two ways. First, when trees are felled, they release the carbon they are storing into the atmosphere. No! Second, trees play a critical role in absorbing the greenhouse gases that fuel global warming. Yay! Fewer forests mean larger amounts of greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere. No! And increase speed and severity of global warming. No! In addition to helping regulate the Earth's climate, Scarlet forests provide habitats That's for Miley's over 80% of the plants and animals that or live dad. on land. But deforestation destroys these habitats, diminishing biodiversity. Some estimate that four to 6,000 rainforest species go extinct each year. This also affects the more than 2 billion people who rely on forests as sources of food and shelter. The biggest driver of deforestation is agriculture. Farmers chop down trees in order to plant crops like soybeans, palm trees, and cocoa, or to make room to raise livestock for beef. Logging operations, which provide the world's wood and paper products, also cut countless trees each year. Forests are also destroyed as a result of growing urban sprawl as land is developed for dwellings. The effects of deforestation are grave, but not irreversible. Efforts such as managing forest resources, eliminating clear cutting, and planting new trees to replace those removed. Seed dispersers, imagine having those naturally. Reduce deforestation's environmental impact on our planet. And while some plant and animal species are gone forever, 
Combating deforestation can help prevent Connor. further loss of biodiversity. Can you do that? On, can you do that after? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. All right, we got it. 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 Okay. Excuse that super long outro that I can't stop. All right. Okay. So, um, we watched a video on deforestation. I talked a little bit about what causes deforestation. You guys, would you guys like a lesson? Thank you for the sub. Would you guys like a lesson? You want a, you want a, a middle school carbon cycle lesson? A quiz. It's not a quiz. I'm going to teach you how this works. Space, can you zoom in for me? All right. So I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about the carbon cycle and why deforestation matters. It is not just there are less trees for monkeys to live in. It is much, much, much more than that. Okay. It affects uh, a lot of different species. It is a huge problem. So before I do also, I'm not a teacher. So if this doesn't go great, I'm really sorry. Um, before I go into how all this works, I want you guys to understand that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, right? Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And the C stands for cringe, okay? It's not good. It's not good to have a bunch of that in the environment. What happens when there's a bunch of carbon dioxide in the, this is our atmosphere, right? This is the earth. It's not a soccer ball. It's, the, it's our planet. All right. This is the earth. This is the sun. Hello. That's the sun. Okay. Sunlight into our atmosphere, but it bounces off, right? And it goes back out. When the sunlight hits CO2 or other greenhouse gases, it doesn't go out. And then it just stays in here. Does that make sense? The more greenhouse gases we have, the hotter, it's a trap, okay? The hotter the earth becomes, right? That is what people mean when they say greenhouse gases. It's it's because it's the it's because it's the greenhouse effect, right? So like a greenhouse, whatever, sun goes in, it tries to go out, it can't. It's a greenhouse. Anybody ha just have an aha moment? Anyone? You can admit it. I had one of those pretty late in life myself. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I say no. All right, so. Here's what happens with deforestation, okay? You take a tree. Oh, what a nice tree, right? Trees take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. We take in oxygen and we release cringe O2 because we're cringe. Carbon dioxide, we release carbon dioxide, okay? Say this is carbon dioxide, this is yours. Okay, I'm a tree. I'll take that for you, don't worry. Oh, it's in my pocket. It's gone, it's not your problem anymore. If you cut open my pocket, cut down the tree, it's gonna release that sequestered CO2. I have sequestered this carbon dioxide in my pocket, the trees have sequestered carbon dioxide. When we cut them down, it releases CO2. CO2 in the atmosphere, bad. CO2, greenhouse gas, right? There's not a tree in my pocket. It's not a tree. It's carbon dioxide. I'm a tree. I'm not a teacher. Okay, I'm doing my best. <laughs> doing my best. So, CO2 is released in the environment. You know what else trees do? 
Respir we do respiration, right? We breathe out carbon dioxide. Trees do transpiration. They release moisture into the air. When trees release moisture into the air, it helps with cooling. A large tree in the Amazon rainforest can release up to 10 bathtubs of water a day. A day. Do you guys realize how much plants are giving off? In transpiration, evapotranspiration, they give off a ton of water, okay? When we cut down that tree, it is now no longer transpiring. It's not doing this anymore. No more water coming off of trees, okay? This is the atmosphere. But now there's all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because we've cut down all these trees. So it is hotter in the atmosphere because of the greenhouse effect, right? There's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, less water. Hotter, less water. What happens when it's really hot and dry? Forest fires. Forest fires. Fire. Yes. So there's more forest fires. The global temperature rises, but it does not stop here. Okay, there's more carbon dioxide in the environment. You know, one thing that the ocean does really well, it's really nice to us. Say this is carbon dioxide, this is yours, I'm the ocean. Let me take that for you. I sequestered it. It's not your problem anymore. It's mine. Good friend. So the ocean takes in a bunch of this carbon dioxide because it's like, I'll take that for you, smile. But when the ocean, when too much carbon dioxide is dissolved into the ocean, it leads to ocean acidification. Ocean acidification bad because why? Coral bleaching and lots of other things. Dead fish, ocean acidification bad. Coral bleaching, bad. Dead fish, dead animals, hotter ocean temperatures, sea level rise. That all makes sense. Corals are very important. They house a lot of our biodiversity in the ocean. So all of this, see this dead fish? It's not just dead fish. There are dead things dying in these fires, right? There are dead things dying because the temperature's too hot for them to live in. There are things dying in the ocean because they relied on eating these fish and now these fish are gone, so now they're gone. Biodiversity works like a plane wing. The more screws, species, you have in it, the more solid it is. When you start taking screws out of it, you start losing species and eventually you're going to take out that one screw that is going to knock the whole wing off. Biodiversity is very important. It works like a domino effect. We need a lot of species to maintain ecosystems. Does this all make sense? So this all starts with this. Deforestation. Cutting down trees. Okay? All right. You can zoom me out again. All right, there's your, there's your lesson for the day, okay? There's your carbon cycle lesson of the day. This is why deforestation is a problem, all right? How much of a problem is it? How much of a problem is it? Here's a, a quiz for you, a question. Here's a poll. How many soccer fields of primary forest has Brazil lost in the past 20 years? This is where our friends Appa and Momo would reside in the wild, in Brazil. Is it 12 million soccer fields, 41 million soccer fields, 55 million soccer fields, or 106 million soccer fields? Type A, B, C, or D, what do you think? How many soccer fields has Brazil lost in the past 20 years in primary forest? How many football fields is that? Someone asked me that yesterday. I thought they were the same. I've definitely played soccer on a football field. It's 100 yards, right? 
Is it different? Are soccer fields supposed to be bigger? I don't care. It's just it's the same sport. Who cares? <laughs> Football fields are bigger. Soccer field is bigger. It's a little bigger. Okay, we'll get over it. Most people think that it's D, 106 million soccer fields. Um, pleased to tell you it is less than that. <laughs> Not pleased to tell you that it's 41 million soccer fields. 41 million soccer fields uh, that Brazil has lost in primary forest in just the past 20 years. <clears throat> That's a lot. That's a lot of soccer fields, okay? Also, what a mistake I made trying to make a relatable measurement, okay? Blame the US, because I have EU and NA viewers, and so I was just like, oh, everyone knows what a soccer field is. Apparently, that's really controversial. Anyway, what percentage of coral reefs does the UN expect to vanish with just a two, per two degrees Celsius increase in global ocean temperatures? So if global or ocean temperatures increase by two degrees Celsius, what percentage of coral reefs does the UN expect to vanish? For reference, I think global ocean temperatures have risen already by 1.1%. I, I, I keep saying percent. 1.1 degrees Celsius, I think, is the current number. So at just 2 degrees Celsius, what percent of coral reefs do we lose? All right. 47% of you think 55%. Terrible news. One, you're wrong. Two, it's 99%. Even worse news than you being wrong. Um, that is a huge, huge devastating thought. 99% of coral reefs with just a two degree Celsius rise in global ocean temperatures. Coral reefs are very, very important. They house a ton of the biodiversity in our oceans. They protect coastal systems from severe flooding. Um, and they are so many screws in our plane wing, okay? So many screws. It's a huge problem. Huge problem. Our climate. This is an interesting one. What percentage of polar bear populations does the IUCN expect to lose by 2050? A little bit of background here. We lose a four mile by four mile by four mile ice cube worth of glaciers every year. Glaciers are polar bear habitat. So sea ice melting is a huge problem for polar bears. Um, and when glaciers melt because of rising global temperatures, they literally don't have anywhere to live. That's where you see all those videos of, of polar bears floating on ice sheets, you know? Um, what percentage of polar bear populations does IUCN expect to lose by 2050 on the rate that we're going right now? Most people think D. The correct answer is B. 30% of polar bear populations by 2050 uh, on our current trajectory. Rising global temperatures affect much more than polar bears. Okay, Polar bears, yes, because they rely on ice and sea ice melting takes away their habitat, literally. <laughs> Just takes it away. Sea turtles, when they lay their eggs, they lay a nest in the sand, there's a temperature gradient, okay? Where it's hotter in that nest, females hatch. When it's cooler, where it's cooler in the nest, males hatch with rising global temperatures. If the entire nest is hotter, we're getting a really bad ratio of female to male sea turtles. And so reproduction rates are going down because there's a bunch of females because the sand's hot. Problem. Whales eat phytoplankton. Phytoplankton rely on cool waters to survive. Ocean temperatures are rising. Phytoplankton are moving to deeper waters where it's cooler. Whales are following them because they need to eat them. And whales are crossing way more boat traffic. We have ship strikes on whales just because they're following their food source to cooler water because they need that. Rising global temperatures affect everything, okay? They affect lots and lots of different species in lots of different ways. And it all starts with deforestation.
not all, but a lot of it starts with deforestation. Okay, good job on the polls. Nice, nice. Speaking of deforestation, have you guys ever heard about palm oil? <laughs> Would you like to talk about palm oil? It's in everything. Yes. 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 Palm oil. Sure. Okay. 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 Palm oil is a vegetable oil. It comes from the fruit of oil palm trees. It is present in 50% of packaged goods globally. 50% of everything in our grocery stores. Okay, 50%. It is in everything. It's in everything. Um, it supplies 40% of the world's vegetable oil demand and just under 6% of the land used to produce all vegetable oils combined. The reason that palm oil is used in so many things is because it's an extremely efficient crop. Um, it has a really high production yield for a pretty small amount of space being used. That's why it's used so much. Um, but the scale at which we have demand for it, the scale at which we demand it is very, very, very unsustainable. And it contributes to a ton of deforestation. That is the oil palm tree above, okay, not this, not this sticker. Above me, above me, that's oil palm fruit. That's where palm oil comes from. Check this out. There's a good chance you're not familiar with it, even though you'll find it in many of the products you use every day. It's in everything from makeup and toothpaste to donuts, chocolate bars, and in some countries, biodiesel fuel. It goes by many names, but it's most commonly known as palm oil. Global consumption of palm oil Can has been doubled up? since 1990. Oil derived from the palm fruit is easy to extract, has a higher yield than other types of vegetable oils, and can be used in dozens of products. But the proliferation of palm oil That's also size poses a it, massive guys. environmental threat. Each year, palm oil plantations destroy millions of acres of forested land, create billions of tons of carbon pollution, and kill endangered wildlife. All of this makes the palm oil industry one of the worst environmental offenders on the planet. In 2015, I can't over 62,000 square miles around the world, much of it former forests, were committed to palm oil plantations. That's an area four times the size of Switzerland. Palm oil is one of the top three drivers of deforestation in Indonesia, a country that supplies more than half of global demand. Each year in Indonesia, fires are set to clear forested lands to make way for palm oil production. Fires! Just last year, over 10,000 square miles were torched, creating fires so big they could be seen from outer space. All of this unleashes massive amounts of carbon into the air. Fires in 2015 added more than 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases Cringo into too. the atmosphere. The burning of forests to clear land for plantations threatens the 10,000 square mile Luso ecosystem in Sumatra, the largest intact swath of rainforest in Southeast Asia. It's home to hundreds of unique species and is the only place left in the world where orangutans, rhinos, tigers, bears, and elephants live side by side. But their home is disappearing around them. The Sumatran tiger and the Sumatran rhino are threatened with extinction. Only a few hundred of each species exist in the wild. 275 left. And their left. habitats are often in the path of land clearing. 400 left. In Borneo, there has been a 50% decrease in orangutan populations in the past 65 years. This is a direct result of the forest fires oh, and so conversion sad. of woodlands for palm oil cultivation. Oh my god, so sad. Alongside logging and mining, land clearing for agriculture is currently one of the leading causes of deforestation. If consumers don't demand more sustainable practices soon, the products we buy can and will contribute to the loss of the world's rainforests. You can help by purchasing products that do not contain palm oil, or if they do, were made sustainably. Go to takepart.com slash palm oil for more information. So, um, somebody asked about like, why do the trees die if you take the fruit? It's not, we're not trying to conserve palm oil trees. Palm oil is a crop. They clear cut a bunch of 
trees in the rainforest and then plant palm oil trees as a crop. Does that make sense? What common products use palm oil? What an excellent question. I cry. Before we talk about the products that it comes in, because I'm not going to leak and spoil the poll, because there's another poll, let's talk about the scale. Alveus is 15 acres. Um, you guys just saw it. You guys have probably seen it before. You've seen me walk around this property. It's pretty large. Also, uh, you don't usually see most of it. But if you guys have watched my stream for a while, you may understand like that, that Alveus is a pretty large property. How many Alveuses do palm oil plantations currently occupy? Alveus is 15 acres. How many Alveuses do palm oil plantations currently occupy? Is it A, 10.3 Alveuses, B, uh, 10,000, C, 1.5 million, or D, 3.3 million? Worldwide. Also, I should know. I don't actually know the the correct plural for Alveus. Is is it? Would there not be an S after that? Would it just be Alveus with the po apostrophe? Probably. It's too late anyway. I'm just asking. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> okay. Most of you guessed C. One point five million Alveuses. Eh. 3.3 million <laughs> Alveuses. Imagine palm oil trees on every inch of this property 3.3 million times. That is the scale. So much palm oil. So much palm oil, okay? Um... Products, somebody asked, what all is it in? Which of the following is not a product that often contains palm oil, do you think? Ice cream, shampoo, biodiesel fuel, apple chips, like the dried ones in a bag. Which one of these do you think palm oil is not in? It's not a trick question. <laughs> a, B, C, or D. Someone said it's gotta be ice cream. A lot of people are guessing ice cream. A lot of people are guessing apple chips. Some people are guessing biodiesel fuel. Interesting, it's kind of split. Interesting, interesting, interesting. All right. Most people said apple chips. That is the correct answer. It is in the rest of these things. Ice cream, shampoo, biodiesel fuel, toothpaste, cookies, pizza crust, pizza. I don't know why I said crust. Pizza, packaged goods, granola bars, cosmetic products, soap. <laughs> it is in everything. It's in everything. Almost everything. So, yeah, someone's like, am I not supposed to wash my hair? Do I not eat ice cream? Do I not use soap? Do I, n do I not use toothpaste? Here's what we can do. Um... I'm just going to let you watch this video and they'll explain it better because it's their video. Here's an organization uh, called the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil or RSPO. This is what they're doing. What is so special about this palm tree? Take a closer look and you can see it's an oil palm tree. Its fruit is used to make palm oil. Palm oil sounds exotic. Actually, we use palm oil every day. It's one of the ingredients in margarine, chocolate, washing powder, lipsticks, cream, shampoo, pastries, baby food, 
instant noodles, candies, and deodorants. Ah! In Africa and Asia, palm oil is used for cooking. We consume quite a lot of palm oil. More than 20 million hectares of land are already covered with palm oil plantations, mainly in Malaysia and Indonesia, but increasingly in parts of Africa and Latin America. This equates to an area more than five times the size of Switzerland. Palm oil has contributed to the clearing of huge areas of rainforest and peatlands, which are important for habitats and healthy ecosystems. But we don't need to cut down trees to produce palm oil. How can we break the link between palm oil and deforestation? Hmm. WWF is doing its part to help. Since 2002, WWF has been negotiating with all the parties involved in and concerned about the production of palm oil. The large producers and the small-scale farmers, traders, manufacturers, retailers, financial institutions and non-governmental organizations advocating for nature conservation and human rights. The aim is to find a solution together. We know that no one organization has all the answers. Which is why in 2004, WWF brought all the parties involved together to meet for the first time. A great start. The result was the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO, a growing non-profit organization with over 3,000 members that work together to make palm oil more sustainable. All of these members are responsible for around half of the world's palm oil production. Finding solutions and compromises is a long and difficult business. Every party brings its own perspective and solutions. WWF argues for nature conservation and for palm oil to benefit small farmers and communities. The majority of the decisions are made by reaching consensus among the members. There is no outvoting the others. The board consists of 16 seats, four of which are reserved for NGOs. One of the huge successes of the round table is the development of a certification standard for sustainable palm oil. This certification standard helps to protect nature and people. It mandates that workers benefit from fair working conditions and wages and that indigenous groups cannot be robbed of their land. Clearing forests and land considered to be important for conservation is forbidden while areas rich in biodiversity and endangered species are under strict protection. Additionally, all new operations must monitor and reduce pollution, including climate change inducing greenhouse gases. And who controls all this? Qualified independent certifiers inspect each plantation to ensure that they meet these standards. Their reports are available on the website rspo.org and anyone who feels there has been a violation of the RSPO rules has the right to file a complaint with the round table. What has the RSPO achieved so far? Over 20% of palm oil production worldwide has been certified to the standards of the round table. This includes over 3.2 million hectares of certified land. To date, the RSPO has helped to conserve nearly 190,000 hectares of highly valuable forest, the equivalent of about 250,000 soccer fields. Thanks to the RSPO, many producers have become more respectful of both the environment and communities, but nevertheless, right. the majority of palm oil producers still have a long way to go. Every five years, RSPO members come together to review the certification standard and make it even stronger. This sets the bar progressively higher for producing sustainable palm oil. The RSPO alone will not stop deforestation. We also need other measures which WWF is supporting. These include new and strengthened protected areas, land use planning that identifies and protects forests, 
companies buying sustainably produced palm oil, new laws around the world that promote sustainable palm oil and forbid conversion of forests and other valuable ecosystems for the products we use every day. Stronger enforcement to ensure companies and growers respect the laws around land use and the bans on clearing valuable forest areas. More informed choices by consumers. And new initiatives to promote innovation in the sustainable palm oil sector, such as RSPO Next right. and the Palm Oil Innovation Group. Combined, all of these efforts will result in a more sustainable palm oil industry, one which supports both people and nature. This is what WWF and other stakeholders are working for. All right. I saw there's a lot of jaded people in chat. It's very interesting. Um, a lot of people are concerned about uh, if this is a, a corrupt organization. Why every five years and not not one year? Uh, how do we trust them? Who cares? I am catching your vibe. I'm catching your drift. I get it, man. I get it. Um, but, I mean, if you don't, you know, if you're not into it, you can go homestead <laughs> and, like, be super sustainable on your own. Um, but this is the best we got right now. This is the best we have right now. Oh, also a lot of people that were like, oh, 20%, really bad. Here's the problem. 20% is bad. <laughs> right? It's not as much as we would like. 20% is not good. RSPO reached out last year to 227 companies to try to get them to get this certification on lock, right? They were like, hey, do this, this, and this, and we'll put this label on your product in the grocery store. 37% of the companies that they reached out to last year didn't respond. Ghosted WWF. I'm sorry, ghosted RSPO. Because why would they? Why would they limit themselves, mess up their margins to get this certification when no one knows about it or cares about it? That's the problem, right? So you can say your consumer choice doesn't matter. You can say they're corrupt. You can say whatever. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but there's a reason that you see pasture-raised eggs in every grocery store nowadays. There's a reason that you see dairy Alter okay, that might be because everyone's lactose intolerant, but like you, there's a reason you see dairy alternatives and meat alternatives in every normal grocery store ever now, and it's because of demand, right? With the big organic boom, there's a reason there's the organic produce in every grocery store you're in. Demand matters, right? Your consumer choice matters. And so more people knowing about this label matters this is the label in the top right corner okay you can do command rspo um or i'm sorry command palm oil uh, it'll take you to a scorecard and on the scorecard they rank companies on how good they do at committing to sustainable palm oil use not all the companies are on there it's a lot less than i than i wish were on there right um but if you want to see how good your favorite company is doing, see if they're on there. You know, Wendy's is on there. They do really bad. But they're on there. Uh, there's Ferrero's on there. Ikea's on there. They're at the top. Um, lots of other things. Check out that scorecard if you want. Um, go look at that scorecard. If you're going to buy some stuff, look at it. One of the reasons that I say you should look at that scorecard is people might just be like, you might just be like, oh, I'll buy this product and I'll read that this is fox hair and I'll read the label and it doesn't have palm oil in the ingredients so I'm good to go wrong palm oil goes by like a million different names like a million different names <laughs> right uh it has it goes by uh oh vegetable oil <laughs> vegetable oil palm kernel oil palm nut oil Colonel, buh, 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 I don't like there are names that don't even sound like palm, like a hundred different names, right? It is impossible to know. Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. Um, those are some names that palm oil goes by. Okay. It's impossible to know if it's palm oil or not, uh, because you're not going to be able to memorize all of the names. So yeah, awareness matters though. Our supply and demand matters. Um, 
So, yeah, I want to tell you guys about that label. I want to tell you guys about that label. Okay. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about, it is a vegetable oil, yeah. Not all vegetable oil, though. It could say vegetable oil and be a different kind of oil, but it also could be palm oil. I don't know. We don't know. All right, let's talk about the pet trade. Talk about the pet trade because it's very important. Also, somebody asked, uh, does this mean that I consume no palm oil? Absolutely not. <laughs> palm oil is in 50% of all the products that we can buy in our grocery stores. Uh, I think it's important to make people aware of it, and it's important to me to, to be aware of what I'm consuming, uh, but nobody can consume no palm oil going forward, and boycotting it isn't going to work. Um, it's not going to work for the economic systems in place and the amount of people that rely on palm oil to make a living, uh, and it's not going to work because it is, it is too far gone. It's in everything. We're all gonna consume palm oil. But if we could consume it with that label, we're gonna be way better off. But again, that label's not popular enough yet is the problem. I have looked for it in grocery stores. I've never seen it, which is really sad. Um, but who knows? Maybe in a couple years we'll be like, hey, remember when I said I've never seen that label? I don't know, we'll see. Okay. The pet trade. It's impossible to avoid entirely, so the best we can do is be aware of better sources. Exactly! Sasha gets it. Sasha gets it. Oh, I still have this CO2 in my pocket. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, the exotic pet trade. This is very important. Um, this is very important because our marmosets came from a really unfortunate exotic pet trade situation. We have our marmosets because they were neglected um, and not properly cared for because someone bought them as pets. Millions of animals, exotic animals, are sold around the world every year as pets. And it's not just monkeys, it's snakes, foxes, slow lorises, other reptiles, geckos, birds, Lions, tigers, bears, I don't know, everything, right? Everybody buys everything as a pet. <laughs> um, 3.24 billion live animals were imported into the U.S. between 2000 and 2014. That's a lot. That's just into the U.S. The internet has made the exotic pet trade more prolific than ever. One, because it's commerce. One, because people can go on the internet. You could look up uh, where to buy a monkey and you could find it. You could find one. Um, and also because videos of exotic animals get a lot of clicks because people like animals and people get a lot of clout from having a wild animal in their house. And they're like, hee hee, look at me with my monkey. Uh, right? It, it's made the exotic pet trade prolific and huge. Okay. Um, released exotic pets can become invasive. We've obviously seen this problem in Florida and other places. Uh, we have a freaking wild, we have a Quaker parrot population in Austin, Texas. What the hell is that? They don't live here. You guys probably live in a places where you see random green parrots. People release their, release their parrots because they can't handle having them as pets. They establish colonies and all of a sudden they're invasive. Um, that's a huge problem. And we don't know exactly how much the industry affects wild populations. It takes time to assess wild populations. The internet and the trade of exotic animals online is relatively new. We don't know what kind of damage it's doing to wild populations. Some we know, uh, but a lot we don't, which is really sad. Um, and people often can't properly care for exotic pets. They rarely work out long term. One of the things about having a wild animal in your house is that it's not supposed to be there. They have a list of qualities that makes them exceptional at being a wild animal. Seed dispersal. Peeing on everything, marking everything, pooping everywhere, biting things, attacking things, being afraid of things. Um, uh, most of the time they do not work out long term because they're not meant to be in your home. So, I, have, I think this is the last video I have for you. Oh! The last video I have for you guys uh, is this one, and it's a little bit longer, but I think it's really interesting. So here it, uh, here it is. That's not it. Here it is. 
We'll go back to that in a second. The exotic pet trade is huge and it's on the rise. Why is it needed? There are thousands of you videos on social media of people posing with I them. Hear it? And these videos are gaining millions of likes and being shared millions of times. Oh, I hear it. I want to find out why primates are such a popular pet choice. It's hard not to humanize a primate when it looks so similar. Does social media paint the full picture of what it's like to own one? They've seen others that have got these monkeys as pets and they think, oh, well, I can have a monkey as a pet. What impact does being kept as a pet have on the primate? They can suffer both physically and psychologically. These abnormal behaviours that they have are life long. And is it right that you can even own one in the first place? That's the kind of cage that Oppo and Momo are in. I've decided to go online to see what's being shared at the moment. All right, um, so let's have a look. This is a video of you. someone bathing their monkey in a sink with soap. Um, which, I mean, I don't know if that's good for them. Uh, let's have a look. It looks like this is a, a shop for diapers. This is like an ad for tiny little diapers, loads of different colours, rainbows, pink ones, and it looks like they're for sale as well. Every single one you go up to is more monkeys, different species, squirrel monkeys, capuchins, marmosets, tamarins. Okay, so this has 220,000 likes and it's a baby monkey wrapped around in what looks like a, like a human baby's like blanket. Oh my God. 3.9 million likes, 225,000 followers, Shoot. all about this guy's pet marmoset. You know, we're not talking about like a few hundred, few thousand likes, 60,000 likes, 200,000 likes, up to a million followers on some of these accounts, and they're dedicated just to 90 their monkey. Million. Massive amounts of comments. Where can I get one? I want one. So cute, so cute. Loads of hearts. These people in the comments, they want one. See, it's weird, because the thing that naturally comes into my head when I look at it, A, shock, that you can have a pet monkey so apparently easily, and is it right to look after a primate? It'd be really interesting to speak to one of these people making these videos and to ask them what it's like looking after a primate when the cameras are off. Hi guys, and welcome to another video. Good morning, look at those people. Say hi everyone. I'm going to meet recently retired veterans, Natasha and Luke, who run a YouTube channel on their squirrel monkey, Ollie. Having taken him in from a rescue center, they then struggled to find any guidance on how to care for him. So they created their channel to educate others on what it's really like to own a primate, the good and the bad. Hi guys, how's it going? Oh my God, I love the background. Is that Ollie in the, in the, in the back there? It is. That is him. I'd really like to meet him. What are you hearing, bud? Hi. Hello. Hello. Can you kind of describe him to me? Can you tell me a little bit more about Ollie? So Ollie is a three-year-old squirrel monkey and we've had him since he was just a very, very tiny baby. Um, squirrel monkeys are very active, as you can see. They have a very short attention span, only a couple of seconds. So he's like a little member of your family. How, how like, how much does this guy mean to you guys? He is buddy. like having an extra <laughs> child. In his mind, I, I think we are his, his monkey family. <laughs> We're just less hairy and a lot bigger. So why do you think it is that people want to have monkeys as pets? I think initially they they see them and they're like, oh, so cute, not realizing it's a 30 year lifetime, all time mm. commitment. They ultimately fail because they don't understand the, the animal. While Ollie has a rest, I want to find out what some of the struggles of keeping him have been. Has having a primate been anything different to how you expected? Yeah, it's been totally different. <laughs> a lot more time is dedicated to a, a primate versus, you know, a dog or a cat. You know, you got to think about its emotions, its feelings, their diet. Just to get a vet for, you know, a primate is a task in itself. There is no monkey sitter. There is no vacation. It is difficult to get a hotel room when yes. you have a monkey. <laughs> There's a lot of different things, though, that go into it that right. I think I would have told myself beforehand. Do you have yeah, the camera's really bad, but that's you could, not the point. Primates, how would you answer to those people <laughs> that say you shouldn't have a wild animal as a pet? I usually tell them you're absolutely right. You do have to have some sort of income because they are expensive to take care of. But at the same time, you can't be working a nine to five job. 
So it's just situationally, we have a different lifestyle than 90% oh, yeah. of America at this point. They're fun, but they're not for everybody. No. A lot of people aren't equipped themselves emotionally for it because it's hard not to humanize a primate when it looks is so similar. And yeah. Has this behavior that's very similar and can be very human like. Um, we've had to actually tell people in, in some comments, like, let hey, him speak. It's, it's still a wild animal. Like, it has. It has no frame of reference for what you're mad about in the comments. <laughs> um. So one thing that I want to note, because I actually haven't seen it in chat, but one of the things that I would expect to see in watching videos like this is um, in both cases, in their case and in our case, uh, we do have monkeys under human care, right? And these people probably care about this monkey. I don't know what kind of, I mean, I assume they take good care of it and care about what he's eating and how safe he is and everything. The difference is um, when, if you're educating people about these animals' wild counterparts, that's not what these people are doing. I think these people are educating people on if they wanna get a pet monkey, how to take care of it. And like, this is, you know, they're a big commitment if you wanna get a pet monkey. Um, we have a very different core stance uh, in that our monkeys are here to represent their wild counterparts uh, and we, try very, very, very hard to represent them as something that does not look like a pet. So people don't click in and see like, oh my God, they have a pet monkey, that's so cool. I want a pet monkey. Um, and I think that content like this online just perpetuates people thinking that. You know, they see like monkey on a shoulder, on a leash and a diaper, and they're like, oh my God, cool. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> and even if all their content is like, it's not for everyone. Like it takes a lot of care and a lot of money. Um, the problem is that they're just, they're, they're showing a monkey as a pet that is the the uh, issue it, it, it's it's eye-opening you know how people view them well guys thank you so much for your time thank you very much thank you having just met two people that actually own a primate that say the one thing that they think people shouldn't do is own primates kind of speaks for itself I want to find out what the landscape is for owning pet primates in the UK. According to the government website, it's estimated that we keep up to 5,000 pet primates here. Some require a dangerous wild animal license, but many require no license at all, including marmosets, tamarins, and squirrel monkeys. I've decided to take a look online to see just how easy they are to buy. Okay, so pet primate for sale. Okay, not very hard at all. The first link, uh, beautiful marmoset babies for adoption, seven months old, vet checked, mm. coming along with the year insurance documents, uh, potty trained and home raised, available now. Mm. All I need is a great home for my capuchin monkey. Monkey that will be a perfect addition to your home. Where are they? So Dorset, Derbyshire, London, Manchester, Berkshire, all of these ads give you no real information like this is a wild animal. It doesn't have any information where they came from. I mean, they look like breeders. These look like people that probably breed them and sell them, but it doesn't have that information on all of them. Scrolling down this site, there's just, I mean, there's endless primates. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's just have a quick look. It's there crazy easy. I don't want you guys to go do that. pages of ads. To go look it up. I could order this right but, now. Literally, I reckon I could call this person up. I could probably say to them, yeah, I've got all of the necessary things. I've got the right cage. I've done I've, some I researches. Say it is I want. remarkably I easy. So this is really, really, really easy. Um, It is super easy. One time I looked up uh, endangered pets for sale just because I was like, I don't know. I was in a mood to just ruin my day, I guess. Um, and... I got a result for a critically endangered gecko from Thailand that they were selling for $300 and I could get it shipped to me. And it was advertised as being critically endangered because people think that's cooler. You know, it's what happens. That's why friggin' that's why streamers are like limited supply of merch. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same concept as people are like, oh, it's cool. Less people can have this because it's endangered. Um, and don't think about what that really means for those wild populations. Um, 
it's a huge problem. How do they import it? Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, really sad answer. <laughs> um, it looks like this. The process. Um, so many animals in the exotic pet trade do not survive in transit. A lot of animals are taken out of the wild to be sold as pets. Uh, above that, that picture in the top right, those are sirens. Those are blue fronted Amazons. That is the same species as siren. I've talked before about uh, blue fronted Amazons have a really predi predictable nesting season. They nest in the same place at the same time every year. Uh, and chicks are very easy to take from nests. So these are all sirens. Um, in these boxes, this was a confiscation in San Paulo, I think, uh, in the 2000s. Um, and these were all parrots that were taken from the wild. Um, and so you can see by this picture, I mean, obviously the scale is much, much larger than this picture, but you can see why this pet trade, if this is one go, would affect wild populations. Uh, because the demand for these pets is so high and honestly, if people are going out and poaching exotic animals for the pet trade, it costs nothing to take five chicks. And if four of them die, but they make $10,000 off of one of them, right? Um, so the transit a lot of times looks really ugly. That's where the picture in the bottom, those are live cockatoos uh, that were transported in water bottles uh, through an airport. The picture above me is some guy looking at a tiger cub for sale. Um, to conceal themselves from the authorities people will put animals in really crazy situations uh, so that they don't get caught because a lot of this transit is illegal um, a lot a lot of the imports and exports of wild animals for the pet trade is illegal which is a good thing but they hide them in crazy ways uh, i've told this story a bunch of times the first ball python that we ever got here at alveus was um shipped from africa it was wild caught and it was shipped from Africa into the US uh, with hundreds of other baby ball pythons shoved in PVC pipe. And it was shipped to LAX through cargo. So they acted like a contractor and they're like, we're just shipping this PVC pipe. Uh, and they had hundreds of baby ball pythons in those pipes. And they were confiscated by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They put birds in hubcaps of cars to drive across borders. <laughs> like tires um they'll put them in water bottles they'll put them in tiny bags they'll i used to work with an armadillo at the zoo that i worked at in college and he was um smuggled into the u.s in a bowling ball bag and they said he was a bowling ball because when they're scared they roll up into a ball so they put him in a ball bag and they're like it's a ball and it was an armadillo um so yeah there are a lot of really, really crazy ways uh, that animals are transported into the States, but it definitely doesn't end there, right? It's like the transit is obviously awful. Taking them out of their wild habitat is awful. Putting them in captivity uh, is never going to give them the lives that they could have had in the wild. Some of our animals here were born in captivity, raised in captivity, so they were never given the option, right? to be wild animals, Momo and Appa, assuming that they were not wild caught, assuming they were bred by a breeder to sell to people online as pets. They never had the chance of living in Brazil like their wild counterparts living in the rainforest. But a lot of these animals that are captured out of the wild for the pet trade had that chance and it was stolen from them. So then that chance is stolen, they're in transit, terrible transit even if they make it through they make it into a home of somebody who doesn't know how to take care of them doesn't have the resources can never give them the life that they would have in the wild and ends up abandoning them at some point because they don't work out in their house because they're wild animals tico was dropped off in a box outside of an spca because parrots live 70 years and they can scream at 130 plus decibels and they chew through wood and they can break your fingers when they bite Tico's probably not even 20 years old and will live to be 60 or 70 years old and was abandoned in a box because they don't work out in your house, right? But it's a huge problem um, because there's constantly videos circulating online of like, look how cool my pet monkey is. Look how cute my pet parrot is. Look how, you know, 
and these villain these these um videos get millions of likes millions of interactions and then you have sanctuaries like this we have a six-figure annual operating cost and we only have two marmosets we couldn't take even 16. but if i looked up videos of pet marmosets online millions and millions and millions and millions of interactions everybody wants one if they go all the way to the point of getting one it's not going to work out and where do they go then because we spend six figures a year running this organization we can only take two the other half of that video if you want to go watch it it's a bbc video on youtube it's just like twice as long we cut it off uh, he goes to a primate sanctuary in the uk and they have like 38 primates and they're at capacity and they definitely have a six-figure annual operating um so uh yeah 38 monkeys six figures a year to keep them in captivity and keep them happy versus millions and millions and millions and million, millions of clicks a day it is an uphill battle um and online doesn't help one thing that you can do uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, WWF, uh, is one of the conveners of the online coalition to end wildlife trafficking. If you see sketchy videos, if you see videos of people selling marmosets, or they're like, new two-month-old baby marmosets up for adoption, they would make a great part of your family. Or you see people selling wildlife parts, selling ivory, selling stuff like that. You can come back to this chat and do command report. It's also a uh, link in my bio. It is in my link tree everywhere. So if you if you don't know how to find that link, just like come back to this chat or you can click on the link on my Twitter or my Instagram um, and you can report those things to World Wildlife Fund uh, and they will check it out. This is not for people that already own the pets. I wish it was. Would, oh my God, would I spam the hell out of them if it was every time I saw a pet monkey in someone's house, I would go report them. It is only for the sale of wildlife and wildlife parts because the amount of people that have the exotic pets uh it's it's too big for the for world wildlife to fund to handle right now but yeah command report uh if you see any of that and you want to do something about it cool makes sense all right recommendations then what can we do that was one of them um so one, reduce, reuse, recycle, smile. <laughs> Using reusable products, reusable water bottles, um, reusable silverware, stuff like that is good um, because then the demand for the commodity is less. Okay, we need, to, we need to consume less so that we're doing less deforestation. Um, and command palm oil. If you're looking at new products to buy, I don't know about y'all, but I'm a huge fan of like staple products. Like if I'm going to buy a brand of frozen pizza, it's probably going to be the same one every time. If I'm going to buy a brand of olive oil, if I'm going to buy a brand of whatever cookies, I don't know. I, I kind of always pick up the same staples. Would be very cool if you guys used Command Palm Oil, that score sheet, to find one that is doing a really good job would go crazy if you could even swap out one of your staples with one that was sustainable palm oil. Okay, that's, that's a great start. Um, brand loyalty, yeah. Uh, tell your friends about Command Palm Oil. One of the biggest problems, again, with the label is that most, not enough people know about it. That's where it starts, the demand is important. Uh, command report, like I just said, so if you come in here and do command report, um, you can report the sale of wildlife and wildlife parts tell your friends about command report if your friends like send you a video and they're like oh my god like they're selling baby tigers i want one and you'd be like well you don't have to confront them if you want you could just report it yourself or you could tell them like hey actually no <laughs> and you could tell people about that um don't purchase or support the exploitation of wild animals this one you can do one of the reasons that the exotic animal trade is so popular online is because they get so many freaking likes you see someone swimming with a tiger and you see someone with a monkey with a diaper on in their house and everyone's like oh my god so funny so cute and they like it and they comment on it you can just not do that actually better yet report it i don't know it's not gonna matter i'm gonna be honest i report on tiktok all the time uh i they're not gonna do anything but 
click not interested, click report. Just don't like it and don't comment on it. Honestly, don't rewatch it. Don't, and don't rewatch it because that helps boost it. Just know that that content is cringe. Okay. Um, so, so don't give them the attention. And then, oh, I already said use reusable products. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, very cool. Um, and then reduce meat consumption. That's a big one. I said 80% of the deforestation that's happened in Brazil in the last 20 years is because of cattle ranching, cattle agriculture. So at the very least, eat less beef um, because animal agriculture is a huge cause for deforestation. So less beef is better. Also, methane is a greenhouse gas, just like carbon dioxide is. So the entire global warming spiral that we went down today, same vibe. Um, someone donated and asked how big of a chance when I buy a parrot or any pet that is not a dog or a house cat, it has come there in an illegal way. That is a really big question that I can't, I can't answer like generally, like here's the percent chance that it's, because it depends on the species, it depends on where you are, what country you are what entity you're buying from um but i wouldn't buy pets from a pet store i'm comfortable saying that as a blanket term because i don't know what their sourcing is but even if their sourcing is not from the wild and it is legal their animal care sucks so i wouldn't do that okay if you guys have questions now is the time because that is the end of the presentation. So we're going into the Q and A segment. So we're going to go back out to the monkeys and I'm going to answer a bunch of your questions. Couldn't social media sites make the content from exotic pets bannable? Social media sites could make content that is really harmful in a lot of ways bannable, but they won't because it does really well <laughs> and they're uh, trying to make money. So they won't. Guys, I have to pee so fast. Um, and then we're going to go outside to the, to the monkeys. And I'm going to answer your questions. If you have questions, do hashtag ask followed by your question. I'll see them in just a second. I'm going to run over there. And space is going to switch it to the backpack cam. Steal it. Did she? No way, she's already done. Yeah, she's not coming back. St stolen. Hi, chat. How's it going? Finally, a real streamer. I know, right? Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. A real streamer that's really good at TFT as well, you know? Um, flamethrower, show flamethrower. It is actually out in the barn because we've been using it here and there. Uh, and, oh god, the cat doing laundry. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Is it on the backpack? Yeah. <sighs> I ran! <sighs> Hello? Are you guys ready to go outside? You guys ready to go to the monkeys? And I'll answer some of your questions. Should I do it on that phone? Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, all right. Okay, 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 okay.
okay. And my chat's broken. And I'm opening it. And you're back. And you're. Um, oh my god. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, uh, question number one. Who said how old will they get? Um, I saw a couple people asking this before. I think they can be to live, I, th I think they can be, I think they can live to be about 15 in captivity. In the wild, um, probably about half that. Generally speaking, animals in captivity, this is very generally speaking, it is not for every species, uh, but it's typically around double the lifespan of uh, their average lifespan in the wild. You guys can't come. All right. Okay. I know there are going to be a lot of questions about this, so I'm going to answer this as best as I can right now uh, with the preface that it's a very hard question to answer. Intelligence is a very, very hard thing to quantify, arguably an impossible thing to quantify, and it's a very hard thing to compare. So, when speaking about parrots, animals that are notoriously intelligent, um, yes, they have excellent problem-solving skills, complex social structures. Uh, have a lot of feelings, have good memories, um, stuff like that. But can I say that they're smarter than blank, blank, or blank? No, not really. Uh, can I say that their brain mass to body size ratio, brain mass to body mass ratio is higher than, say, an emu? Target anybody? <laughs> yes. Does that make sense? So like humans, the size of our brain. our body but there are animals that have a much smaller brain to body mass ratio make sense Sad. Stand by. We have to swap access points because the backpack is a stupid, big, dumb baby. It can't do anything itself. <laughs> All right. Oh, hello, monkey. Oh, hello, other monkey. Cassie said, do they ever like to get pets and cuddles? The answer is no. Occasionally, Appa will let us touch him, but they don't like it. Like a dog likes to be pet. Like if I went to go touch Momo, He's just going to move away and be like, what are you doing? You see what I mean? <laughs> like leaning into it like a cat and like, he's like, oh yes, pet me. Um, they're not like that. Okay. Um. <laughs> Hello. You guys want to be part of Um, there are several different species of marmosets. We have two here. We got a common marmoset on my shoulder and then the back of my head. Um, these are both classified as least concerned by IUCN right now, but their populations are declining. Why is this happening? What's happening? They, it's, there's like 
humming. It's choppy. Okay, Chad, I'm just going to keep talking. Um, this is a good question. Someone said, do they poop all over or in a particular spot? They are excellent at pooping all over. They're seed dispersers. Their ecological niche in the wild is seed dispersing. So they will eat um, fruits and then they'll swing around the trees and poop in as many places as possible because that is dispersing the most, the most seeds. And then they important. They poop everywhere. <laughs> and they bite sometimes. Someone asked if it hurts when they bite and the answer is yes. It happens. Um, these two cannot make babies. These are both male. I don't trust you. Get away from me. No, 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 no. <clears throat> um, is there a species also a part of the illegal pet trade? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would actually argue that marmosets, marmosets and capuchins probably are some of the most common in the pet trade because uh, people want like a little, please don't, like a little manageable, manageable <laughs> monkey. Um, you want to see the questions? Um, and people think capuchins are cute. Honestly, probably because of friends, if I'm being honest. I think that's where it started. So you can, that's their fault. Um, 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 um. Don't you guys have a page where you can report selling exotic animals? Uh, yes, it's not my page, but you can do command report. That is World Wildlife Fund's coalition to end online wildlife trafficking. You can you can report the sale of wildlife and wildlife. Pro Does the report command work on the Alvea channel? Mm -hmm. It works on the Alvea channel as well, so you can go there too. Um, um, um. Do they still get iPad time now that they've been moved into a proper enclosure? Uh, they haven't had their iPad in a while. Sometimes we let them watch stuff on our phones, which is part of why Appa keeps coming over here. Um, but, yeah. Where'd that question go? Oh, wait, what? Oh, no. Oh, no. I, oh. Oh, God. Okay, stay away. I need to go find my place. I lost it. Okay, 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 okay. Um, yes, I found it. Okay. How did you get started in conservation? I'd love to, but I don't know where to start on the West Coast. Um, I grew up on a farm, so I've always been around animals. Um, and I started volunteering at a humane society when I was in high school, uh, volunteered at a therapeutic horseback riding program. And then once I got to college, I started volunteering at a zoo and that volunteering opportunity at the zoo turned into an internship unpaid. Um, and then that internship turned into a job and then that job turned into this stream. So that's how I started. Papa's on the cameraman, pray for him. A lot of people are asking about the palm oil scorecard and like what number they should look for. Uh, they make it pretty easy on there where it's like their scores are like green, yellow, and red. I think generally speaking, red being the worst, green being the best. I think generally speaking, I would just avoid the red ones. <laughs> um, and like, you know, the, the if it's green, the higher the score, the better, but you know. Um, Mm -hmm. 
Did the person who owned Momo and Appa prior not have the correct knowledge with what to feed them, which is why they ended up with medical with the medical conditions they have slash had? Yes. Um, I think that's the case. I think the guy really liked them. I think he cared about them, uh, but didn't feed them the proper diet. Their proper diet is also expensive. We buy them three different types of food, and it's not like you can just go to PetSmart and, like, buy a 60-pound bag of dog food. It's, like, it's special ordered online, uh, and we give them three different types, and so it, it gets expensive. I think that's another part of it, um, and also he just didn't know what to feed them. What do they smell like? Peach. They, these are Brazilian monkeys. Um, their range map is earlier in this stream today, if you want to go back and look at the presentation. Hello. Let me see chat. Um... A couple questions about lifespan. Um, they can be up to 15-ish, I think, in captivity. In the wild, it's more like five to seven. Are you comfortable with them being near your neck? Uh, this one, yes. Can I, I can't see chat, thank you. He's gonna leak something. Oh God. Hello. <laughs> okay, their favorite foods. Can I look at chat again? <laughs> their favorite foods are um, their gel diet, banana. They like apple. Um, yeah, those are the big ones. They like fruits. I'd love to start volunteering similar to what you did. What sort of jobs could I be looking at in the future if I had no degrees involving animals? Um, I have an agriculture degree. Obviously, a biology degree is, like, your probably the best thing that you can do, unless it's, like, zoology or, like, wildlife conservation, if you can get one of those. It's obviously better. Um, but you don't necessarily need, need that degree uh, to work with animals. Uh, it, experience is huge, so if you're able to volunteer somewhere, great. Do they like water? Would they bathe or wash themselves in the wild? Uh, these guys do not like water, no. Uh, in the wild, I don't think that they would be very into it either. Um, I've never seen them in the wild, though. But here, like, they don't try to take baths or anything. Are you eating? Are you looking at the phone? Um... What do they get for enrichment? Um, they get lots of different types of enrichment. Uh, they get puzzle feeders. Um, these are like, this is a hanging enrichment we put in here ages ago. So we'll put like gel diet and stuff in here so that they have to reach under to get it. Uh, anything like foraging that feels like foraging for their food is good for them. Um, they've gotten some stuffed animals, uh, some frozen stuffed animals. They've gotten paper cups, paper plates. Do you add space for animals in need, or are there other places that take in other specific animals? How does this all work? So, um, our process in uh, is one, do we have the money to build them an appropriate enclosure? Uh, two, do we have the experience on our staff to properly care for the animal, give them the training and the time that they need? Do we have the resources on our staff and the time um, to give the animal what we feel that they need? Uh, 
Four, is there a conservation story that this animal has that we need to share? Like, do they need a voice? Um, take like a crunchy audio. Huh? Why? Fine? Weird. I don't know. Okay, you wanna see chat? And then also we think about the liability. <laughs> you know, we're not gonna get big cats, tigers, and lions and stuff here uh, because it wouldn't be safe for us and we don't have the space to give them the kind of enclosure that we think that they need. These guys make a lot of sense uh, because, is that nice? And I thank you for, I can read chat. Um, a larger primate would be a huge liability because they're, they're very strong for their size. Um, they have a voice or they have a, uh, they so for them, like all of today, we talked about deforestation, we talked about the pet trade, because these guys are heavily exploited in the pet trade, um, and we had the resources. So we already had this enclosure, we just built onto it uh, and made it into something that would work really well for them. So, yeah. Yeah. I know people that have psych degrees uh, that work in animal training, so could be. Um, these guys do in groups. What? They'll live in groups of usually, I think, up to 15. Okay kind of went through these. Hello. Is their grip stronger than a human baby? Definitely no. Babies are abnormal, like, extraterrestrially strong. I don't know why, but they definitely can't grab like a baby can. Hello, buddy. I didn't think you could jump that far. But you did. I don't know why this battery would be, unless they just like never turned it off yesterday. Cool. Maybe that's what it The mic feels bad again? Yeah. Hello? I hate, I hate these clips. Um, hello? 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 Hi. Someone said, how often do we, he's relaxing, he's relaxing too. How often do we change the enclosure to make it more exciting for them? Um, so the ropes, we don't switch around all that much, but we did design it so that they could get hooked and unhooked like this. So it's easy to change it up if we want to. Um, the marmosets do get enrichment every day though. So these ropes, um, 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 over here, for example, these are enrichment ropes. So we'll hang enrichment from here for them uh, or place enrichment on their platform um, so they get new things every day uh, to keep this enclosure more exciting for them. <laughs> what type of animal is it? This is a black tufted marmoset, sorry. 
This is a black tufted marmoset. This is a common marmoset. He has white tufts. The other one has black tufts. Do they pull apart ropes or destroy their enclosure? They're surprisingly good at getting into things. Like when we give them enrichment, they can rip things. Uh, they don't rip up these ropes though. They do make a mess. The ropes. These guys are not breeding, they're both male. So they will not have babies. They do use their tails for balance. So their tails are not, but they can use them to help balance in the trees. Oh, wow. This is a big question. Um, also, wait, this one first. Would they be able to... Oh, then that question went away. That makes sense. Uh, sorry, I will answer that in a second. Said, would they be able to bite through wire, for example? No. Um, they, they couldn't chew through wire, I don't think. Um, not this wire, anyway. Um, somebody asked, like, what their quality of life is here compared to a zoo. It's an impossible question to ask. I like to say that comparing zoos is like comparing restaurants. Um, there are some that are really, really garbage and some that are really, really great. Um, and some that are essential for preserving the biodiversity, or not the biodiversity, the genetic diversity of a species in captivity. Um, the audio is just fucked. I guess we can go inside. I don't know. They said it's not the mic, though, which I don't know why they would know that, but that's what PJ, you said. Fixed. Hooray. Hello. Um, I was saying comparing zoos is like comparing restaurants. There are some that are really bad, some that are really good. Uh, and a lot of zoos are really important for maintaining genetic diversity in captivity. Uh, and if we didn't have them, we would not have uh, a lot of species. Um, so some zoos are really important. Some zoos do really, really great animal care. Uh, top of the line animal care um, and the animals have really good quality of life and some zoos do terrible animal care um, so I don't know how we compare to all zoos uh, but we're really really proud of our animal care here um, their diets their enclosures their training uh, you know we do the best that we can I don't know of any reliable resource to rank all zoos, but I can tell you uh, AZA, American Association, or Association of Zoos and Aquariums, is the American like standard. Like You can be an AZA zoo, and there's a bunch of standards to be an AZA zoo. Um, and then there are zoos that are private that don't have certifications like that. So, yeah. A lot of people are asking, they're, they're both males. I guess I could see why people would see them and think that they're a, a breeding pair, but they're not. They will not mate. They're boys. Both boys. Can they swim? I don't know. Genuinely, I don't know. I would never test it. I think for their life, they wouldn't choose to, for the record. Like, they, they don't swim in the wild. If they somehow got in a situation where they had to, could they? I don't know. Chimpanzees cannot. Like, they're physically incapable of swimming the way their bodies are built. I, I don't know. 
from marmosets? It's a good question. If they had a chance to escape, would they or would they come back? If we left the doors open, they would probably leave. And I don't like to think about that because it would be a nightmare trying to get them back here. Because no, they wouldn't like go hang out and then come back because this is where they get fed. Um, they would probably just leave and then they would die very quickly. How are they doing now? Are they being treated for anything like noodle with mites? Uh, they're doing great. Um, the marmosets currently have no medical issues, no special medical issues that we are, we are addressing. Bye. My tail is stuck. It's not stuck. It just isn't all the way through there. All right. This is also an interesting question. How many hours do they sleep a day? They're diurnal, um, so they, they are awake during the day. They sleep at night. You can watch on the live cams if you literally, if you wanted to take some data of, like, how long you think they're sleeping. They just sleep through the night. So when it gets dark, they're sleeping. When it's light, they're awake. So it's probably pretty similar to us. Um, they may take some naps during the day as well. All right. Do they have an instinct to burrow to escape danger? Is it only climb? These guys live in like the upper canopy levels of the rainforest. Um, so their instinct is to climb. Um, they don't dig underground. I've never seen them seriously fight. They do like wrestle every now and then. They kind of play fight with each other. Uh, but I've never seen them like fight fight. They get along very well. Their tails are not prehensile. Um, they are just for balance. So they can't grab anything with their tails, uh, but they can balance with them. Are they also hunted because of their fur, or is pet trade the big biggest concern? Good question. Uh, I have not read anything about people capturing marmosets for fur, for the fur trade. Um, definitely the pet trade, though. A couple people have asked about their favorite snacks. They like banana, and they like apple, and they like their gel diet the most. They just like fruity things. In the wild, do they mate for life? Uh, no, they don't. Um, sometimes males will have multiple female partners, um, but they, they do have like breeding pairs. Usually breeding pairs will be like the head of their group, um, their group of like 15 or something. It'll be led by a breeding pair, not by a male or a female in particular. And then the rest uh, of the individuals in that group, their social rank is based solely on age uh, and not sex. So the youngest ones are at the bottom. Um, older ones are at the top. They definitely do recognize us. Yes. Um, I was going to say, I think that goes for all animals at Alvis, but maybe not. I don't know. It's hard to know. Uh, but the marmosets definitely do. All right. All right, um, a couple more questions. How are they during the winter months? This will be their first winter in this enclosure. Uh, so we'll see. We did get them in the winter of last year, but they were inside for six months uh, doing rehab with us. Uh, so we haven't seen them in the winter yet. We will see. We'll see. Um, all right. Is one jealous if you give only one food slash enrichment? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> 
Uh, you definitely have to make two enrichment items for them and feed them both. Or they would be very upset. All right. I would like to go back um, to the studio. Appa, thank you for your time. Thank you for the bite. Uh, Momo, thank you for your time. I know that was a lot of work. How are the teeth doing? I know one lost most of them. It was Momo who lost uh, more than half of his teeth. And when I say lost, I mean they were removed because he had dental disease. He had an improper diet before he came to us. So they removed more than half of his teeth. Um, but he's doing well. Um, he does well eating the stuff that we give him. Um, his weight is consistent. So he's, he's doing good adapting to it. He makes it work. He makes it work. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. -mm 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 -mm. What should I do if there's a local place that is a sanctuary that lets people interact with big cats? Um, just don't go. <laughs> if people are offering experiences or like cub petting and like taking pictures with big cats or going in with... <laughs> That's a red flag. Um, as for like... I don't know. It depends on where you are and... The regulations in that state too for what they'll allow it's possible that it's in within legal limits which is tragic could you repeat this escape question i got an ad uh, i think someone said like it was like do they dig to escape uh, and i said that they live in like mid to high canopy of the rainforest and so they're their instinct would be to climb not to dig, they don't dig. Um, you cannot visit Alveus. Alveus is not open to the public. One, because uh, I'm a streamer and the internet is cringe and that would be really dangerous for both us and the animals to like welcome people to this facility. And two, um, because we get to teach thousands of people online like this. Thank you guys so much for being here. And the animals don't even know that they're teaching people. And so we really get to provide true sanctuary to them where there's not people running around and screaming, and like put, putting their hands through the wires, you know, and bothering them. So it's cool that we, the animals get to like really just chill here and only interact with the people that they know, our staff, uh, and the people that do training with them um, and they don't have to deal with like all of the what is the word I'm looking not variation all of the variables, variables thank you all of the variables that come with the public children that's the word I was looking for <laughs> yeah um, all right you guys that is gonna be it for animal quest today thank you so much for watching I hope you learned a lot uh, remember, you guys can do command uh, report and command and command and command um, palm oil to look at to look at some of that stuff today that we learned about today. If you want to come back to those resources, please do. The subathon is still going on on the Alveus channel. Um, Connor Connor is live twenty four seven. Gifted subs are discounted as of today, so you can go. Uh, make it so that Connor never has to stop working yeah. for the rest of his life. I'm going to rate Alvaez. Uh, we are live on the Alvaez channel 24-7 right now for the subathon. So don't go anywhere. Leave it on a second monitor or just leave this tab open uh, because it'll be pretty much the same stream. Uh, Connor's setting up right now. And I'm going to start the raid. So don't go anywhere. Stay for the subathon. Hang out. It's a really good time. It's kind of cozy. I'll say I like it. Uh, this is all here because Connor sleeps here. By the way.
He had to push it all to the side. Nate! Wait, why'd you give me 100 subs? Did you mean to do that to Alvaeus? Nate? Nate? Was that an accident? Hello? There we go. Hello? No. Oh, thank you. Nate, thank you for the 100 gifted subs. Okay, um, rating in 12 days. Go over there. See you in a second. Hello, Pat. How's it going? Scatter. Assemble. 